So, cl- oh, hey, now we're live. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning into the Banff Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Lafferty. Today, we're here with one of our occasional forays into the life of a writer. Um, I've got two genuine writers here. Sorry, here. Uh, Ryan M. Danks below me and Walt Rebilliard. And um, Ryan, I'm going to put your run a little banner here. That There's Ryan's blogs where he writes about the business of being a writer. And um, Walt, although some people only know him from the RPG business, Walt has been making kind of a splash in eBooks this last year or two. And um, well, let's, uh, before we get too deep into talking about writer stuff, Walt, do you want to plug your fiction real fast? Um, maybe a minute. <laughs> maybe a minute. Um, and, uh, let's, let's talk to Ryan first, because I'm here all the time. All right, cool. You know, I have the hat, dog, you know, and the say hi. Mm-hmm. That, that's so, it. yeah, and the dog. So, I mean, Ryan's never here. He he only comes on once in a while when we bribe him with coffee and those those illicit pictures from Tijuana in two thousand and one. <laughs> Actually, it's been like two, like what was it, 2018, 2017? Yeah, yeah, coffee and concepts with me. Yeah, 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 as well. I want to have you on talk about Jade Punk back in the day, but um, hey, we got you oh, now. Jade um, so Punk. hey. So it sounds like you're making the move a lot of people make, which is you're looking at RPGs going, you know, I love the fame, but there's all this material success possible with fiction these days. So you're trying to make the jump over to that? Um, yeah. I I got out of RPGs and back – Jade Punk, um, Shadowcraft, uh, Age of Anarchy. Just each one made less than the, the previous one. Um, I don't know what that says about me as a creator or, as a, or if Jade Punk was really the thing, but – Jade Punk um, took me less time to make than all the others. It was a 30 minute concept and that I, I created in 30 minutes and then put it out there and everyone liked it. Everything else I spent months on. So maybe that's the thing, but either way, RPGs didn't make a lot of money. Um, I started most of the writing I do right now is on medium.com starting to see some financial gains there. And really, um, how's that? How, if you don't mind me asking, how's that work? So <clears throat> um, it, it's kind of how I'm putting together my, my fiction business too, that I'm, I'm going to launch starting next week. But uh, medium.com is based on read time. So it costs roughly $50 a year. It's, it's $5 a month, but they have a $50 a year um, uh, plan. And what they do is say Walt had a, a membership there for $50 a year and he came and read my stuff for 10 minutes, but didn't read anything else. I get all 50 bucks. Um, if he reads something that you put up and I put up and he spends, say, 20 minutes on yours and 30 minutes on mine, I'm going to get roughly $26, $29, and you'll get $20. So it splits it up based on the number, the amount of time that you spend reading on every on um, all the different people. So if you write, if you read a whole bunch of different people, each person's only getting a couple cents for your time. And they base it on read time. So I, I kind of like that. It's kind of like how Kindle Unlimited does. Um, you get paid per page read. And they split up this big pot amongst all the pages read. Um, it's very similar to that, but it's based on read time. Okay. I hadn't realized that Medium was a subscription service. That's cool. So they have, you can read, I believe it's three articles a month without, just for free. Anybody can read three articles a month. Um, and I don't get paid if you don't have a subscription and go read that article. But then if you do sign up after, I get paid for everything you've read of mine since or before. So um, it's, it's a cool concept because they have 2 million unique visitors every month. They definitely have um, the income. There's some people in there that make lots of money. Um, I think the, the biggest one was Tim Denning last month or the month before made like 26000 for the month. Tim Denning, he's the four-hour workday guy, right? Or four-hour workweek guy? I think he's he, – I know he's big on it. I don't know if he made that, but I know he's big on it. Okay, cool, cool. Um, so you're building up some readership here, and you're hoping to leverage that when you make a jump over to doing ebook novels? Yeah. Uh, mediums mostly for nonfiction. So um, I have a big background in business and um, a, a big background in publishing, which is kind of over here. Um, and then – the medium caters to that audience. I want to open up a uh, fiction audience and uh, which I would much rather just do fiction all day, but I do enjoy the advice style articles. You could kind of mix it up and do fix- advice for a fictional world. 
Yeah. Yeah. You know, help my, my, my sentient sword is trying to possess me. What do I do? I don't. <laughs> <laughs> that's, all, that's awesome. See, now you can go on medium. Yeah. Um, don't tempt me. I, 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 I have lots of free time. And, yeah. yeah. Fiction or, or uh, fitness, politics, culture, business, that kind of stuff is what makes most of the money there. But there's got to be an, with 2 million people, there's got to be people interested in D and D and other, other kinds of stuff. How do you avoid the siren song of clickbait? So the rule on clickbait there is as long as if your if your headline said one thing and your article was totally different, that's clickbait. But if I said, hey, seven ways to do X, and I listed seven ways to do X, I'm good. Um, or if I said, do this one thing to never be depressed again, but I actually gave you a thing that will probably not make you depressed or at least help you be happy. It's not technically clickbait to their standards. They are trying to cut that out, though. They're trying to limit that a bit. Okay. And I'm just going to say, because there's outrageous headlines will get people to click. Oh, yeah. And, uh, like book covers and titles. That's why it's called bait, right? So, yeah. yeah. So, all right, cool. Um, so tell us about your, your um, you have novels you're writing, right? Yes, uh, kind of. So I really like the medium concept because... It is based on how I have to earn your time. If you click on my article and go in there and click away, I got nothing. You've got to spend time. I've got to catch you with that first line, the first paragraph. I have to lead you through things. So if I'm not interesting to you, then you're going to bounce, you know, and then I'm not going to get paid. I like that model. So what I want to do is use the Kindle Unlimited model for the same thing. I really want to try to, I, I feel like it's the same thing. If you read page one and you decide to go to page two, I'm earning your money. I'm earning the business. And that makes it where I need to be a better writer. Um, and, but also I need to care about my story. It's not like I'm, unfortunately, I've seen a lot. I've read a lot and purchased a lot of books that had a kick-ass cover because that's number one. That's the, the most important thing to sell a book. It had a nice title and the description was on point, but the book was atrocious. And... I didn't want it this way. Someone can at little to no cost, depending if they have Kindle Unlimited or not. Um, but if they have Kindle Unlimited, no cost, go in and check it out. And then if they like it, I'm earning it. And then when it comes to page views and people actually buying into it that way, I know if I make a sequel, it's going to do well because they liked the first one or they didn't. But they read if they read through all the way, I'm getting paid on that way. And so I'm going for a more, and I feel like. I feel like this is the way the publishing business is headed anyway, is a content model. So um, I feel like everyone's going to be working on a content base. The, you know, creators always can make more money on frequency. The faster and more often you put something out, the more money you make. And I'm thinking, so what I'm planning on doing is releasing a serialized fiction where once a week I'm releasing something new. After six to eight weeks, they'll form a full novel and then I can sell them as a package deal to people that don't have Kindle Unlimited. Um, but my focus is going to be that serialized, aiming towards Kindle Unlimited um, people and trying to get that just 52 publishing things a, week, a, month, a year. And that's the business. That's the way I'm going. I'm, I'm going to cry. So when you, say, when you say 52 things a year on Kindle Unlimited, um, are you talking short stories, novellas with the occasional novel sprinkled in there every once in a while? Because that's that's a breakneck pace. Yeah, and that's, so that's a lot of words. I'm thinking like like between two thousand and five thousand words a week. Okay, um, which that's is totally doable. Yeah, I do like a thousand words an hour. So two to two thousand to five thousand words is a, is a as a you know decent day when I consider editing and such. Um, so I could do that. My biggest concern right now, and I'm just, this is just because I'm just now exploring it is how I'm going to do covers because I don't want it to just be a black cover with volume one, volume two. That's, you know, that won't attract anybody and co covers are the most important. The um, cover artist and pay them and pay them what they ask, treat them yeah. right, pay them up front. You, you'll rock it. Yeah. But every week <laughs> that yeah, I, like I would, I, I would think you got to do like, stock art for three out of four of them and then every once in a while you got a big splashy one for a larger release but well you're, you're the expert in this area what do you think i'm not really an expert i'm 
So uh, I'm still suckling the teat of the publishing world. So, um, but it's a good thing we got could, with the, the explicit tag. If you're going to be talking about teats on here, man. No, that's... no, I was, I was, I, I went for uh, terminology over profanity. Um, but uh, the the thing, uh, you could do with with a model like that, especially coming out every week, where you want that cover. That's um, you, you probably want to connect your cities. Um, as far as like, so you're saying uh, three to six weeks, and then combine that into a full length novel, right? Six to eight weeks, maybe. But yeah. Six to eight weeks. Okay, yeah. So six to eight weeks. So what you could do is you could do, uh, you know, like a half and half model. Get that piece of stock art that has, um, a uh, you know, like a nice background with with maybe some scenery in it, and and hire somebody from you know, one of these uh, these. Um, for higher sites and say, hey, look, you know, um, I need a character a week. W would you accept 25 bucks? Oh, wow. You know, and then what you do is every chapter you put that like new, it doesn't have to be a different character. It could be the same character in different positions, jumping, doing whatever, right? Everybody associates this these chapters with the same property because you, you have the same background every time. And then uh, they know it's a new chapter by looking at the thumbnail because now it's either a different character or a character in a different pose, right? So um, it links your property together, but at the same time, it also gives you that that sense of um, of momentum because each cover is slightly different, you know. And at the end, you could even take that six to eight pieces, right? Do a, a thumbnail sketch. Uh, so I used to work a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. I used to do thumbnails for comics, and um, you could do Dream like job. a th uh, what's that? Dream job. Yeah, well, it was well, like, until the until the comic industry went bust in the late nineties, early two thousands, and yeah. you know, suddenly I was scrambling, which is where RPGs came into into the focus. Um, but um, you know, you could take like uh, those six to eight chapter pieces of art, and then um, at the when the final book is done, right, you have that thing that has that scene piece that has carried your model throughout uh, eight chapters. And then slap all the art together in one piece on the cover as a unified whole, so that uh, all the book is together, and now all the art is together. You know, and, and it's almost like uh, back in the day when we used to run to the comic shop as kids to collect every every alternate cover because when you put all the alternate covers together, it made a big giant poster. Yeah, like X Men, Jim Lee's X Men number one. Yep. Yeah. So I, there's there's one thing you could do for that model uh, and still keep consistent and because cover is is a large part of choice. It's going to be the first thing that that drags somebody in, and you know if if you have something that's interesting and evocative every week, you know you could potentially turn that uh, you could potentially turn that um, that interested party that might have perused one chapter into a repeat offender <laughs> because yeah. you know they they see the you know. I like the way that ended. Um, I didn't think I was going to buy another one, but you know, uh, the new cover has this on it, and I, I, all right, I kind of need to know more, you mm -hmm. know. So yeah, that that could be that could be a lot of fun. That's a that's a that's a neat way to publish. And I mean, if if industry giants like Stephen King and his Green Mile series are any indication, people like serials because it's a, it's especially in today's day and age. The only thing you got to be careful of is. Um, as we progress more with uh, the digital market, um, audio is increasingly becoming more and more frequent. It's becoming more accessible and becoming more uh, available to you know the common man through things like Podium and Audible and and Odd Fans and all these other services. And the thing about those is, um, uh, like for example, um, I had three novels picked up by. Uh, um, Athon Books. So, um, one of the first things that they said in their criticism of the of the initial manuscript was, "This is really great. This would read great as serial, but it's going to suck for audio because your chapters are too goddamn short." So, I had to go in and restructure the entire book and take that almost almost down uh, and kind of not reskin it shift some things around um and uh yeah yeah my short story stuff uh yeah yeah uh, yeah there's a couple of good good pieces there so, hey don't you get weird dog um come here but um the uh um 
said that you know your, your chapters are too short because uh, uh you know um you're not giving anybody anything to really listen to um and right when they're getting into one chapter they end getting uh what do you call it they end up getting finished with one chapter before it really even starts so yeah you, you wanted those longer chapters you wanted uh, uh a deeper experience reader so they're more invested in each chapter um you know now while that was true in my case um uh, it didn't it does not have to be true for everybody um, um why uh, are, sorry just curious uh, why the that only because right now i'm listening to the full sun saga by jackson crawford yep and the chapters are tiny or yeah. some of them and i don't even notice because i maybe it's audible that does it but it just it feels like the chapters just string together yeah yeah um well it, it's an issue. i'm just it curious could, could be my writing style could be they they, they said that uh um you know uh because of the way that, that everything was structured uh they they would like longer chapters to go with uh uh how the book was written so i said you know no problem we can we can work with that uh and like i said uh, uh you were just saying with your example you know there were shorter chapters and uh um, I had listened to other chapters, uh, other things as well. Um, people like uh, Scott Moon, uh, who does a uh, fantastic mech series, uh, also did uh, uh, the Last Reaper series, um, which had some like minimal quick chapters in it. Uh, you got uh, Josh Hayes, uh, who does um, uh, the Valor series, uh, which is like military thriller, a couple set a couple hundred years from now. There were a couple of short chapters in there. So uh, what might work for me might not work for anybody else. But with the with the advent of audio, you know, you wanna you wanna make sure that uh, you know not only does your do your chapters read well, but they sound well too. Because when that narrator gets it, um, and I've done some narration work as well, um, when that narrator gets it, man, the, something that reads great might sound like um, like a total tongue twister when you get it like out and it's 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 really a pain in the butt <laughs> to, to read that on the mic. That was uh that was a tip they used to give us in journalism school way back when I was new newspaper writing was um especially if you're doing a longer piece, you know, something for the for the Sunday edition or whatever. Yes. Read it out loud to yourself. Yeah. See how it flows. Um because when you're writing for a popular audience, you're not writing an academic paper conversational tone yeah, and, uh, and uh, Hemingway was huge on reading his own stuff and listening to it and that's a great thing too like uh you know um uh, all these author communities they really bring people together with diverse experience to to um highlight new and incoming authors uh to uh kind of kind of give you that that edge that you didn't think you, you needed i mean like um i thought uh i thought i wrote pretty well uh with the exception of um because of my background and the way i grew up um i never met a conjunction i didn't like um, <laughs> i threw them everywhere it was like a shotgun blast going off um so you know that was something i was always struggled with but you know there were other things in my writing as well that uh, like uh pieces of syntax that you just i don't know they just they don't work when you say them out loud and uh really awesome editor um ellen campbell uh, she has said all the time and she advocates for it all the time. You know, once you're done with something, put it, put it in a drawer, let it sit for a couple of weeks, a month, whatever, take it out and then either read it back to yourself. Or like I have an app that I, I keep on my phone, uh, that reads stuff back to me and you'd be amazed at the mistakes that you catch. I mean, oh, that yeah. you, I mean, just reading it over and you're like, that's amazing. I'm going to be the next Hemingway. And then you have the phone read it out and it's like, you sound like a donkey on meth. It's like, <laughs> ton of them. so yeah, yeah. It's, it, there's, there's a lot of good tri tips and tricks out there and a lot of great communities. It's kind of like the difference between uh, working your heavy bag versus sparring. You know, you're thinking you're Rocky, you know, knocking the bag around your garage and you spar with somebody and it's a homely experience because you're interacting with reality on a more intense level. Oh yeah, um, and I've had nothing but seven months on a heavy bag. <laughs> no sparring here. Oh, I know, I know. Hey, is it okay if we name check these guys? Yo, oh, hell yeah, go, go they... for it. Where right. you want to? Um, speaking of writing communities, um, this is Keystroke Medium, uh, which Walt is a contributing member, and I jump in every once in a while and contribute, you know, an occasional comment. But uh, yeah, these guys do anthologies. They have regular podcasts talking about the craft of writing. Um, I want to be them when I grow up. Um, 
I read yeah. the one this week. I didn't even know they existed until I talked to Walt last week, and then I started looking into it. And they got some. I, I listened to a few of their podcasts. Yeah, great community, uh, really open, very, very open to dialogue and and differences of opinions. Um, uh, lots of great shows. So, like, for example, on Mondays, you got the, the main hosts and they bring in uh, they do roundtable discussions and then they do um, they do uh, uh, interviews with big name authors. Uh, you have uh, my show, which is normally on Tuesdays, but it's it's a short week here in the United States. So. Uh, I'm scrambling for every bit of time I can get. Um, so uh, I do coffee and concepts on Tuesday mornings usually, and it's a more short format, 5, 10, 15 minutes, where I talk a little bit about coffee and a little bit about writing, bring in some guests and, and poke them for their coffee choices because, you know, th that's why everybody comes to me is the coffee. And then um, um, on Thursday nights, they have a great show uh, with uh, – um, called the writer's journey, which is kind of like people who are just getting into writing, or if you're a reader and you want to know why certain writers do certain things, uh, they bring in people on the show to kind of talk about the craft and, and how things work. Uh, they had, uh, R.A. Salvatore on last week. Oh, wow. And, uh, yeah, yeah. He was, he was a great interview. He, he, he really talked it up. So he is a, he is a, a spunky young writer. I hope he sticks with her, with it. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but, um, you know, they, uh, they're really good about, uh, uh, the, uh, the two ladies that run that show are really good about, uh, condensing the talking points into bite-sized portions that you can t easily take away with you. Uh, and then for more longer format, they have, uh, a story on, uh, like a, a long form story and anal analysis on, uh, YouTube, uh, where, um, they have people that really dissect things and, and over a period of a couple of hours, uh, have some really interesting talking points. It's a great community. Um, and it's, it's, it's very uh, open to where, um, you know, uh, you can just come in and talk about stuff. Uh, we really don't do a lot of promotion on that show other than to promote the show and, uh, and the channel itself. Um, but, like, you know, you, you're not, you're not going to go in there. And, and that's the big thing when you go into an author community. It, the, because you got so many authors that are just dying to let me tell you about my book. It's like, dude, <laughs> you're just like the the thirty other people with books like yours. Nobody cares, right? Right. You know, start start your own group. That's where you talk about your book. This is where we talk about the craft of writing or talking about things you enjoyed or things you saw in in writing and fiction. And I apologize about the glare. Uh, my window is, uh, yeah, but um, the. Uh, uh, it's a great community, great, really, really fun time. And uh, they're uh, starting, I believe, at the end of the month, they're going to be launching their own coffee brand. So, uh, yeah, there's there's a lot of stuff going on, a lot of fun. There's there's always shenanigans going on in there, but it's good natured. It's lighthearted. Uh, not a lot of politics unless you talk about uh, – uh, Editor Supreme Ellen Campbell and who she's going to cut this week. <laughs> you know, we're out slow – getting into merchandise here on the Banff podcast. So we have our own brand of processed cheese food. <laughs> <laughs> is, it the spray, is it the spray cheese? It works as cheese or as a disinfectant, which is handy in these plague years. So, uh, <laughs> That's fantastic. You're looking for that on your grocery shelves and also at your hardware supply stores. Yes. <laughs> yes. Can you use it as an adhesive? Because that would make it an all-in-one for me. <laughs> you something to make something sticky? Well, I, you know, I hate it when my, I, I don't like regular, I don't eat a lot of regular bread because my, uh, I need something to have my sandwiches stick in the flatbread because the stuff all falls apart. You got to kind of grip it. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the manufacturer, see what we can do for you. Walt. Put a little, put a little stick in there. Like Walt know? wants the sticky cheese. Can you help us out here? <laughs> it's called Bruyere. <laughs> And that's going to be our catchphrase, 21 here on the BAMP Podcast. Yes. What wants the sticky cheese? I, I want the sticky cheese. Uh, we have fun. Sorry. So, Ryan, uh, you, you play a lot on Twitter uh, more than Facebook. Uh, what kind of interaction do you have over there? Um, so I, I don't know how many people buy into this concept, but I know a lot do. Um, I'm kind of against – the traditional publishing format. And one of the reasons is because of how Twitter goes. Um, one of the things that people, agents and things push is uh, what's your Twitter following? And so they want the number for some reason, an arbitrary number came to be 5,000 and everyone wanted, oh, you have to have 5,000 followers. So that, that created this like for like game 
where everybody or follow for follow where hey i'll follow you you follow me and i got yeah. into that hard last year and i had over i had like 5500 followers but no engagement like no one wanted to talk because they weren't following me for the 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 chat they were following me because i was following them and they wanted their numbers up so i went through a little while ago and just started unfollowing pretty much everybody that I don't actively engage with and who doesn't engage with me to my knowledge. And then when they see that they do, I, I refollow them again. Um, since then I can tell who's playing the game because I lost a thousand followers or more in like two weeks yeah. um, because there's a game and, and it doesn't mean anything at the end of the day. Uh, it's a vanity thing. So um, I go to Twitter mostly because it feels more like if I'm trying to talk about writing or uh, if I'm going to chance a political con uh, statement of some kind, uh, Twitter seems to be the place that is more forgiving of it and more interested. Facebook, um, like I follow you there and, and then we're friends and a few other people, um, a few hundred other people, but they're all friends. Like that's mostly where it's personal for me. When it comes to my, right. my Facebook business account, that's just sharing. I treat that like LinkedIn. Here's a link to my newest article. Here's a link to my newest book, and that's about it. Right. On. Um, although Instagram, I'm a little more personal on, and and it links to my business account on Facebook, so there is some of the personal there. Uh, but Twitter is where I feel like it's just the, the world's mouth vomit. So. <laughs> I well. Oh my god, that's fantastic! I, yeah. I gotta, I gotta tell you, um. My experience with Twitter and Facebook is very different, but on Facebook, I have unfollowed everybody who likes, um, if I read your stuff and I get annoyed or if I see you arguing with people for yes. about, dumb, about, sorry, explicit tag, dumb shit, then I unfollow you because I have enough anxiety in my life. Um, exactly. So I don't get, and especially sometimes the RPG world can flare up in some spectacularly stupid arguments. <laughs> <laughs> or if you weigh in, you're going to be seen as favoring one side or the other, but I just want to weigh in and say you're both idiots and that doesn't make you any friends. And at the end of the day, aren't you in RPGs because you're trying to sell books? Well, then don't wait in those kind of arguments. Stay out of it. But I, I see spectacularly stupid things happen on RPG Twitter sometimes. I mean, l last year, somebody faked that they had a book uh, banned on, on drive through and they, they dummied up a page and took a screenshot of it to say that they had someone had, you know, the DTRPG had banned their book. And this was right during a big convention. So no one from DTRPG could respond to it because they were all man in the convention booth. Within a matter of hours, there were dozens of people just dogpiling a DTRPG, calling them, you know, every name you can imagine from fascist to whatever. I think I remember that. Yeah. And they, they got back and they're like, no, this isn't what happened. Here's what happened. Here's the receipts. Here's our screenshots to show what happened. And everyone was like, oh, but Sorry about point. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, and something like that seems to, I mean, not quite that spectacular, but sometimes that spectacular seems like that happens on the regular. And I almost feel like people are just hanging out there like vultures waiting for some kind of, some kind of drama to drop so they can all dogpile because what the fuck else do they have to do with their time? Oh, I sound like an old man. God damn. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I think it's the mentality of a gamer, right? If we're playing a game, we sit yeah. around waiting for our turn to hit the bad guy. And that's probably kind of what it feels like with the politics is, oh, it's my turn to my forum. I get to talk and, and I don't know, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, there are lots of people whose politics I agree completely with who I just wish would shut up on Twitter because <laughs> the way they make their points is terrible and yeah. they're alienating people from viewpoints that they might otherwise share the way they're making their case. Oh, and, I sure uh, this on I don't know if it was Twitter or Facebook that I shared it on, but I told everyone um, the best way to piss everyone off right now is to say that you don't intend to vote because everyone thinks that it's a moral obligation and that you're evil if you vote for the other person. So I'm like, well, if I, the best way to piss everyone off is to, I didn't say I wasn't going to, I just said it's the best way to piss everyone off and lots of heat about it. And I said, okay, well, first of all, if I do vote, how do you know I'm going to vote for your candidate? And it was, it was just crazy how how yeah how it blew up. Um, yeah, and while I might have strong opinions, the thing is that is a viable position, and in fact, every election, most Americans do exactly what you just described. Which I'm not. I intend to. Yeah. Actually, no, it's, it was just uh, I was like, it's an interesting yeah. concept. I think I I said something today. It's I I try to stay in the middle. I am kind of in the middle. I'm an independent, but 
Um, even today, I said, you know, where I went to high school, um, you know, I had to be careful wearing red or blue depending on who I'm around because reds and cri bloods and crips. But today, it feels the same thing. Twenty years later, um, but for election reasons. Yeah, they've been stealing election signs in my neighborhood. Uh, from, from both sides. It's, uh, it's a very passive aggressive white suburban kind of thing. But, you know, this guy gets his sign stolen. Someone else, the other side gets their sign stolen. And uh, my neighbor, God bless him, um, he puts up little passive aggressive signs in his yard next to his big campaign sign saying, you know, <laughs> you're, you're on camera because I got my $25 ring up there on the wall and it can take a shitty video of you and we'll have some vague description to give. The, but yeah, it's anyway, back on subject because that was a huge yeah. tangent. And I apologize as a writer. Do you see Twitter being worth your time for promotion or is it kind of borderline? Who are you asking? Uh, I, I think Walt has given up on Twitter years ago. So I guess I'm asking you. What you're <laughs> <doing>. <laughs> um, I think it's, I don't think it's useful. Um, I follow the, the concept, the principle of um, let allow your work to sell your work. Um, but I, I'm, I'm kind of, irritated that I don't think it's useful because Google Plus was incredibly useful. Um, that's pretty much what made Jade Punk a thing um, was all of the awesome Google Plus people. And when I shared my blog posts down there, people actually went and read it. I share something on Twitter and my mom might like it. Like I don't that's lost in a sea. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know if it's na in nature, the nature of Twitter. If, okay. So if you're trying to traditionally publish, I think it's necessary to build not a huge following, but a huge engagement because agents and publishers think it matters. And it might, I do know a, a, um, a really cool lady on there, um, uh, Amanda Stockton. She goes off by Batmo, Batwanda, Batmonda, something like that, Batwomanda. Um, but she is, she has tons of engagement and if she put up a book for sale, people are going to jump in. Same with um, EM Knight, EK Knight, I can't remember mm -hmm. what she is. Um, same thing. They have so much engagement that when they do something, people people jump in. So I think if you're engaging on Twitter and you're not playing stupid games, it probably is useful. But if you are just putting up, going, you know, hashtag writing community and doing some stupid poll or so, which I've been I've been guilty of, just to get engagement, that's not going to work, and you're wasting your time. But if you spend the time to build genuine connections, it probably is as good as anything else. Um, but I don't know that it beats anything necessarily. Yeah, the Ron, Ron Fraser in the comments agrees with you. Hey, Ron. <laughs> hey, Ron. Oh, Ron Fraser's here. What's up, man? I love Ron. Um, he was uh, like my first uh, J Punk fan. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. I, as, I like as far as uh, uh, like Twitter goes, um, I I have to agree with Ryan. There's there's so much going on in Twitter. It, it feels like when you do put out a post, you know, unless it's tagged nine ways to Sunday, you have flashing lights. There's a there's a you know a a, a sexy something with spinning whatever on the cover of your tweet. I mean, there's you're not really gonna. You might engage with some people that that might see it at the time but yeah i never really noticed a lot of a lot of uh click through or w what have you um the one place i'd noticed that i always seem to um uh, and this is going back to ryan's point as well the one place i always seem to get the most engagement is in a targeted community so someplace like google plus where you had targeted groups um place like uh you know some of the groups and pages on facebook um you know, people who, who are there for the specific thing that you're talking about, you're going to get that engagement. Somebody who's just scrolling through on Twitter, like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> Next, <laughs> Kardashian. You know, I mean, it's like, uh, you're once again, you're, you're unless you're saying something explicitly offensive or you have a massive following already, you might not get that engagement. And, and, and to tell you the truth, I don't, do a, I mean, I post pictures of my dog, I, you know, cool, like ranger stuff that comes across my feed or, or like military stuff, uh, Kung Fu stuff. Um, if somebody's doing like stupid human tricks that are really awesome, you know, I'll, I'll put that in. Um, and that's really the extent of my social media stuff. Um, with the exception of posting the, uh, the keystroke medium, or, um, uh, I try to get, uh, very involved in, uh, the galaxy's edge group of books, um, and, and for their community, uh, because I run their podcast and, and a couple of other different facets. So, I mean, it's, 
I, I go to those groups that engage in those things because that's where we all get together to talk about those things versus just putting it, you know, on my lawn and hopefully somebody sees it. Um, and those targeted groups are really the place to, to, to start, especially as an author to like build that, build that engagement with an audience that could potentially lead to, um, uh, uh, getting people into a newsletter, which is more targeted, getting people into your own page or, or group. And, and I, I know myself, the shortcoming I have as a, a writer who's going to probably be promoting himself a lot more in the next, and then, and uh, trying to keep my dog and cat from fighting. Hey, you two get over here. Um, and trying to keep, uh, trying to keep myself engaged. And, and the, the thing is though, social media, I have to dedicate a certain amount of time to it. And that's it. That's what I do. That's what I do. You know, whereas I know writers that get up, they write for a couple hours, they go out, they exercise a little bit, they check social media for 15 to 20 minutes, then they go back to writing a couple hours, exercise, check social media. And I, I can't do that. It, it, I don't have the time for that. I don't have the time for that kind of engagement. So, um, you know, because in addition to all this writing, so since January, I'm at almost half a half a million words. So, right. right, it's a lot. I have to always find time for writing. I have to always find time to get get the stuff plugged in. Um, but the amazing that, thing is, those are all different words. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's not just the same. <laughs> Rock and roll, copy paste. But on top of that, I also have Hazard Studio uh, that I work with with uh, Dominique Sumner and a couple other folks. And it's like it's like uh, you know you you constantly juggling. And if I'm sitting there going, "What are we mad about on Facebook today?" or "Oh my God, somebody called me a whore on Twitter," it's you know if I'm if I'm focusing on that, I'm not writing, I'm not drawing, I'm not um, doing layout for people, I'm not assembling covers, I'm not doing uh, cool YouTube videos or Twitch videos for people. You know, I mean, one of the one of the really interesting things that has happened this year is um, I teamed up with the writers of Galaxy's Edge to produce a show where we game with James M. Ward, one of the creators of Dungeons and Dragons do that every Friday on Twitch. It's building a huge following. Um, but if I'm, you know, if after I post, Hey, we're doing this thing on Friday, this is what we're doing. Uh, come check us out. Thanks guys. Peace. If I turn back and, and look, you know, go down the rabbit hole of cat videos and end up on the other side of people setting fires to somebody's testicles because they, they had a political affiliation, I'm not going to get anything done. So like, you know, I, I get crap all the time. It's like, how big's your newsletter? It's like, dude, I got like, I, I like, uh, my mom and like two other people and my mom's been dead for two years, you know, oh, well, what's your, what's your Twitter, what's your Twitter stuff like? I, I think I got like a hundred people on there. Um, and they're all people I, I personally like, so that's it. You know, it's like, why aren't you engaging more? It's like, bitch, I'm writing, I'm busy, yeah. you know? And it's, it's like, if I need to market myself that hard, uh, then obviously I'm not putting as much Oomph and as much passion and fire and technical ability into the writing because I'm trying to focus it all into that social media. Now, some writers, they have people for this. They have people that do their social media posts. They have people that engage with them. Um, uh, but then again, I'm not a full-time writer. I mean, like right when I get off this show, I'm stripping off my shirt, jumping in the shower and going to work for 12 hours. You know, so it's like, it's like, I wish I could be like, I, now I love Larry Coria right? Love his stuff. I love Monster Hunter International. I love uh, the Dead Sick stuff. I love his stuff. He is vibrant all over Facebook and Twitter. And, and his favorite thing to do in his breaks from when he's writing is to troll people of different political affiliations. <laughs> he loves it. Loves causing fires, uh, right? Because awesome. what's that? I just nah, never mind. Sorry. Yeah. So I mean, that's his gig. He 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 enjoys it just because of the fact that he he enjoys when if he's got to scroll through four hundred posts and there's somebody with an intelligent point, he'll do it just for that one person who had that one knowledge of wisdom that he can take take away. You know, which uh, that's a little more work than I'm willing to put in. But then again, once again, I have a I have a fifty five to five hour. Uh, a week work week. So if I want to get words in, if I want to get, uh, you know, if I want to get some drawing or layout or, or, you know, if I want to play with a cat, you know, I 
have to, I, I have to ignore all the social media. You know, I have to do my two posts a day and I have to like a couple friends videos because, um, they're, cause they're funny and they might include something fuzzy. And then that's that, you know, get, get to work, get to writing. Hey, by the way, uh, Troy Howitt says hi, and he thinks you have a uh, healthy relationship with social media, but he's unfamiliar with flaming testicle tw Twitters. <laughs> <laughs> we will post the links. It'll be amazing. So, well, um, I don't know if you've heard of how Sterling and Stone do their pro promotion stuff. They are not big on social media. Um, they've got a podcast, but as far as I understand, it's pretty new. Everything is newsletter. And what they do is at the end of every book, they're leading people to their newsletter. Their first book is free. And then um, they tell you at the end of the first book, if you want the second book free, sign up for our newsletter and we'll send it to you. And they build a massive newsletter and it takes no time on a daily basis to maintain that. Um, and you get more engagement to people who actually subscribe to you to get you in their inbox than you do for someone who just clicked follow once. Right on. So, I yeah. don't know. It might be an idea to... Help yeah, out. we have, um, I have, God, last count. Um, I have 500 people in my newsletter. Oh, um, right. yeah. So, um, they, and they're, they're pretty, um, you know, you, you can get all the cool toys if you get the right newsletter kicked out. Um, okay. so that, um, you know, you know, if somebody's open to your stuff and whether they've read it or not. Um, so, uh, but as what, uh, what, what newsletter, provider do you use for that i use mailchimp it's it's standard it's easy um i'm thinking about moving to mail or light though because i've been hearing about uh really upgraded features so uh i might move that way so i i haven't really had the time to investigate yet there's a lot of stuff going on in the background uh more than just my cat but um the um but yeah, I, you know, I send out and I get a uh, pretty regular engagement from that. Um, the one thing everybody was excited about was in the beginning, I was sending uh, the the trilogy that uh, I'm going to be producing. It should be, they're doing the audio for it now for the audio book. Um, and uh, the before this had all kind of come to a head, I had produced side series. I had written uh, some other things for it. Uh, and I, I created a, pre a prequel story, short story, um, about 25, 30,000 words uh, of an event that happens before the first, first book and it introduces one of the characters. Uh, but you get to see her in her native environment versus in the book where she kind of shows up and kind of just gives advice. Uh, but she's pretty pretty badass character so i was like yeah she needs her own story so um one day i was talking to one of the hosts on keystroke medium uh, kaylee williams and i said you know your voice would be perfect for uh this kind of like badass space marshal that i have and i i said have you ever thought about narrating and she's like yeah you know i've been i've been uh kind of thinking of it and i said well listen uh let's work something out and she narrated my uh, she narrated the free book that I was giving out to my newsletter. So now um, you know you sign up for the newsletter, you not only get the free book, uh, you get uh, you get the audio as well. And the great thing uh, about pushing out a book, uh, uh, there's a service called Book Funnel. Uh, do you use that, Ryan? I not currently, but I've heard of it. Yeah, so um, it's uh, book distribution for your private mailer lists or what have you. Patreon can use. I mean, however you want to distribute your book uh, outside of like mainstream retailers, uh, you can use it, right? And uh, they just created an audio option. So now when somebody signs up for the newsletter, my newsletter automatically sends them the short story and the link back to my website where the audio is hosted. Hmm. So not only are they getting the short story to hopefully ingrain them into the universe, uh, you know, but on the other side, they get the audio, which brings them to the website. Now they can peruse, see what else we have for sale, so forth and so on, you know, and it's not so much of a sales tactic as it is. Um, I just wanted people to have some fun that was easily accessible. You want to read it. That's cool. If you get some time on your lunch break where you're sitting outside, you want to listen to it. It's all right there on your phone. And if you got your phone with you, it's it's just a lot of fun. And hopefully, you enjoy the universe enough to come for book one. Um, and and you know, um, we've gotten a lot of good feedback on the uh, the read that Kayleen did. She did a fantastic job. Uh, one of my friends from the army, his daughter, did some of the artwork on the uh, 
on the uh, web page where the book is hosted. So that was kind of fun, you know, young, give a young artist a little, a little platform to kind of shine a little bit. And she's only 16 years. Oh, whoa, that's a cat. She's only 16 years old. So, um, um, you know, uh, maybe we can expect great things, you know? So, I mean, there's, there's a lot to like in a platform like that, where you use a newsletter to engage and you're not getting all the vitriol or, you know, the rampant, uh, to quote galaxy's edge dumpster fire. That is a lot of these social media platforms. Yeah. Back before Warren Ellis got canceled, that was one reason he had moved his audience engagement to a newsletter situation was because yeah he, he had a huge twitter following but most of them were not engaging and he'd been on twitter forever so a lot of them were just ghost accounts yeah and that's before you even run the scan to see well how many bots are following me so it's um i think twitter is great for people who want to do celebrity gossip or yell at each other or it's probably great for the ideal target audience which i think is teenagers who want to talk about teenager stuff but i think for anything else you kind of got uh, a lot of obstacles to making it work right for you so, you know to tell you the truth, Ryan is the only reason I keep Twitter. Me? Yeah. Every time I send a tweet to, you know, you always have that ideal reader in the back of your head. You're always my, my ideal reader when I send a Twitter. I'm like, okay, what's Walt going to think of this? Yeah. Is it, like, this should... Walt with it? like, that's always in my head. Nine times out of 10, man, I give it a thumbs up and then I share it because you, you put out good stuff. So, yeah, hell yeah. But that's re You're really the only reason I keep Twitter. Oh, wow. <laughs> I'm really sad that I wasn't the only reason you keep Twitter. Well, but I hell, get to man? see you every day. I don't get to see Ryan every day because he yeah. he only comes on when his beard looks magnificent. It is a magnificent beard. You're, you're, that's a writer's beard right there. He's mean. I, I oh. expect to see you with a like a tumbler full of scotch and uh, maybe a pipe. And... <laughs> hell yeah. Um, Tro Hewitt says, I would read the heck out of a Medium article on social media by your guest. So uh, there you go, Ryan. Oh, yeah. oh sweet. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm everywhere on social media. I'm at Ryan M. Banks. Are you on MeWe, though? Because that's where it's really added, <laughs> MeWe. I, yeah. uh, I actually limit – uh, so Social Dilemma, I don't know if you guys have seen it, scared the hell out of me. Um, I've been scared to watch it, actually. I hear things. I mean, some people refute it. Some people don't like it. I, For me, it made massive sense. And um, so I, even before then, though, I was already limiting. But Facebook, Instagram – Twitter is all I'm on. LinkedIn, because I just got out, unfortunately, COVID, um, when everyone went back to school, all my kids were stuck at home and I had, someone had to come home. My wife is the breadwinner, so it was me. Um, but when I was there, I was I was I had to be very active in um, business. Like I was an operations director. So um, I was on LinkedIn a lot and I didn't build a following or anything, but I, I do know a lot of people who make decent money through uh, LinkedIn promotion, and, and there's a lot of more engagement there. I think it's going the way of Facebook, but it started out pretty decent. You know, I got a buddy who's a C-level in security at a, a bank here in Colorado, and he's got a following on, Fa on LinkedIn these days, um, basically developed by... I don't want to say fucking with salespeople, but as a C level <laughs> in security, you get a lot of sales guys coming on to you. And he would just try to write them long critiques of here's why your sales pitch to me sucked. And just breaking it down like you're obviously haven't don't know anything about my business. You don't hit me anything in the first paragraph, how you're gonna solve a problem for me. Your swag is stupid. I don't care about socks with your company logo. <laughs> I don't care about coffee mugs with your company logo. And it's it, to me, it's borderline verbal abuse, but sales guys love it. He's 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 given little symposiums and shit, and they they just line oh, it. Awesome. I think it's because sales guys burn out every five to ten years. So there's always a new crop of sales salespeople who are just looking for the verbal abuse to try to yeah. you know sculpt their pitch for the next guy a little bit better. That's so, my experience too. I had to do a lot of sales in my other one and on my old job, and it was you. Know, I, I think you're right. Five six years, and you're either promoted out of sales or you leave for something else. There's only so long you can do that. And I mean, there, there's, there's some guys who are Svengali or Rasputin, and they can just they know how to crack that safe every time. Um, super, super good for skills, though. Uh, yeah. Nothing is better than learning how to sell. When I was working at Walden Books a long time ago. Oh, wow. You worked for Walden, so did I. Yeah, yeah. I, at a mall back in Indiana, we had to sell these yeah. stupid book club cards. And um, if I come at you with enthusiasm, I'm going to scare you. I don't know if it's because of my size or my voice. <laughs> but if I start to come at you and then I say, I'm not sure this is for you. 
<laughs> I, I, I was the best salesperson there while I was working there because that was always my approach was I start to go, I'm not sure you'd be interested. And then like, oh, well, tell me more. And once I've got you saying, tell me more, I'm already halfway home. And that yeah. was, uh, yeah, so that's, <laughs> that's not relevant to books. But, you know, maybe this, the, your next book cover is, we're not sure this book is for you. <laughs> <laughs> You know that book? Uh, I don't remember the name of it, but it was like "You'll Hate This Book" or something like that. And yeah. it's a bestseller. Yeah, it's you know. Sometimes, uh, it works. Sometimes just breaking the usual pattern of interaction. People are always used to it being this way, and you just do something a little bit different, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, that is our hour, and I, I've got a little boy coming home from school soon. I need to go build Legos with him. So uh, nice. Ryan. Real awesome. pleasure talking to you, sir. Uh, I'd like to start doing these kind of writer talks every Wednesday. So maybe we can have you and Walt back on sometime in the future, and uh, we can do a whole writer Wednesday series about, uh, you know, how to misuse social media for the you know best you know, <laughs> results. And I'm super down. I would I would rather talk about uh, uh, the misused word list or the abused word list. That sounds like <laughs> an episode, episode topic right there. I love it. Do it. Just malapropisms. No, no, no. Like, uh, um, you know, uh, things like uh, when your character talks to somebody, they have to turn around or they looked or they they huffed or they breathed or, you know, uh, so, you know, just all these weird action beats that you don't need to put in because you're not writing a screenplay. Yeah, I, that was yeah, that, that's a pet peeve of mine, you know, or, you know, he said adjective or he, he said i guess it would be a adverb you know like tom tom swift said breath breathlessly or whatever hey thanks troy appreciate you watching he just a great great episode gents hey thanks troy appreciate right. it man yeah there, there's a, a deep and wide vein we could mine of uh, you know, <laughs> writing advice like that and then at the end we play full contact scrabble full contact. whoa oh well, yeah i don't know what that is but it sounds cool but, but it needs to happen <laughs> yeah. uh you know tabletop simulator probably has that uh, let's do it. All right, cool. Anyway, it is uh, one minute past the hour. Can I wrap things Rock. up? Uh, to all our viewers and listeners out there on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook, thank you. This is our two days in a row without Facebook taking down a podcast mid-podcast. So um, we are two days without a broadcasting accident here on the BAMF podcast. So Walt and Troy, thank you very much. Appreciate you what? guys coming on. Yeah, uh-huh. Don't forget to thank Ryan because, you know, he's not Troy. Didn't, I didn't say, fuck, I'm sorry. <laughs> no me. Troy, thank you for watching. Ryan, thank you for coming on the show. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. My, my brain is, <laughs> Ryan says, we'll take a Z. Ciao. <laughs> Obviously, my brain is, is Swiss cheese at three in the afternoon mountain time, so forgive me. And uh, we'll catch you all next time on the Vamp Podcast. Thank you very much. Arrivederci.